Yeah, there you go. Um, so yeah, so agriculture as a sector has has a number of challenges. Um, sort of some of them shown here. So one is the environment. So um, both you know the environmental impact on the bed and dispersion of waste and chemicals in the water column. Um, you know, secondly, there's managing um, fish health and and sea lice. Uh, then there's also harmful algal blooms, and there's um, and these are all kind of related to to the issue of space. So obviously, if you're cramming lots of um, development into a, a small region you're going to have a much larger environmental impact so this is why um, a lot of the industry are now looking um, to, you know, towards more offshore environments um, where, where you know you can expand and, and have and reduce the environmental footprint in, in these more exposed and um, you know typically dispersive environments um, so yeah so there's a number of hypothesized benefits to moving offshore um, uh, you know, this, this, this more dispersive environment generally will reduce the pressure of sea lice. Um, offshore environments are less likely to be impacted by uh, harmful algal blooms. Um, offshore environments, again, are meant to be more dispersive of waste and chemicals. Um, and salmon health and welfare uh, will improve in more dispersive environments. Um, so, uh, as I say, these are all hypotheses. So this is where the off aqua project kind of came in to, to look at some of these um, and uh, yeah, try and quantify them. Um, yeah, so I, I should say that obviously the, the cost you know, benefit analysis is that operation, um, yeah, operation in more exposed offshore environments is obviously a lot more challenging. So, so we've got to, got to weigh up the, the pros and cons of, of, of this. Um, so in terms of uh, regulation and what, what kind of modeling requirements are required by regulators, so, there was a review, a, a review that came out in February this year, so that might is kind of more up to date. But I'm just uh, here looking at the 2019 guidance. Um, so, so, so yeah, the, the you know the basic points are that, that the modelling needs to predict the spatial extent and intensity of, of, of impacts. Um, you need to be able to predict the wider environmental impacts, so beyond the kind of initial farm site. Um, you need to be able to predict the um, the site inter interaction or connectivity, so the kind of connectivity between different sites and how they might, um, you know, the lo location of a certain site might increase the pressures on on other sites, or you know, um, find connectivity between um, of sea lice between sites, uh, e you know, easier. Um, and then, kind of finally, and probably you know, really relevant here is is that the the appropriate mod modeling methods or you know. The, the appropriate level of complexity of modeling you choose is a case by case um, is decided on a case by case basis. So there's no kind of one standard that the modeling has to meet this kind of um, level of complexity. So that's where you know it's, it's uh, this kind of subjectivity comes in of um, you know how, you know what processes we need to include and what sort of level of modeling, whether two D, three D, and what sort of resolution is required. Um, to resolve the, the kind of aqua, aquaculture relevant physics in, in that region. So looking at the west coast of Scotland, um, obviously along the west coast it's, it's, it's highly developed, um, although you know, there's a lot of aquaculture development. Um, you know, the, uh, you can see here there's, there's lots of sites that, um, along this stretch of coastline and there's a huge uh, variability in uh, different types of environments. So um, I, I kind of say it's more it's more uh, complicated than just saying a site is exposed or a site is you know, sheltered. There's it's in reality it's this continuum um, of of sort of forcing mechanisms where you have some sites which are say more inshore and more freshwater influenced, and then you know sites that might be more offshore and you know seasonally stratified and have you know a slightly different uh, forcing dynamics. Um, and sort of most locations along the west coast can probably be um, classed as these kind of traditional um, or, or mixed regions where you have um, sort of a lot of mixed forcing factors. So it's not it's not sort of one or the other. Um, so in the Off Aqua project, we looked at uh, sort of these three main main sites. So uh, BDNC in the south, which I won't actually talk about in this talk. Um, but then there's um, Loch Linny, uh, which is a kind of more traditional sea lock site, uh, and then our kind of offshore, um, you know, slightly more exposed open shelf 
um, site was on the northeast coast of Rum. So I'm, I'm going to be focusing on the Rum and the Linny uh, sites because this is where um, I've sort of developed more of the modelling. Um, so uh, what physics are relevant to agriculture is, is kind of, you know, obviously a key question here. And we're kind of defining key physics as, as the processes that significantly influence agriculture impacts. Um, so, you know, dilution of waste, connectivity between farms. And we kind of split these into um, you kind of, your local dynamics, which influence the, 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 the immediate footprint of, of the farm site. So, um, you know, tides, wind-driven flows, uh, freshwater layers, local mixing processes. Uh, and then secondly, the kind of larger regional dynamics, which influence the connectivity between farms. Um, so the underlying residual flows and, and, and freshwater behavior. So, you know, the, the hypothesis is that as sort of model resolution, you know, and model complexity increases, the, the simulations will converge on, on these key agriculture relevant physics. Um, so as part of the, the off aqua project, we, we went out to these sites and collected physical data sets um, to use to, to validate the models. Uh, some of the data I'll touch on briefly later in the talk. Um, but yeah, we, we just kind of had these, these questions of how we're going to, 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 to validate and test our, test our models. Um, so the large scale model um, that I've used is the Westcoms 2 model. Um, the domain shown here in the center. So this is um, an unstructured mesh um, model using EPICOM, um, covering you know, all of the west coast of Scotland. Um, the, the meteorological forcing is taken from a two kilometer um, WR, WRF model. So weather research and forecasting model. Uh, the model, so the first iteration of the model is, it's been run operationally since 2013. And then uh, the domain you see here is the, is the extended version that was extended in 2019. Um, and it's, the model's got 10 vertical layers and a horizontal resolution of around 130 meters, but obviously varying significantly between the, the, the open boundary um, and then higher resolution in the kind of regions of interest uh, sort of between the islands. Um, yeah, and sort of this, as I've said, the, the two sites where I've, I've then uh, nested um, my high resolution EPICOM models within this domain, uh, focusing on, on the RUM uh, and, and Loch Linny. So just for those who are less kind of familiar with hydrodynamic modeling, this is this kind of really nice il illustration, uh, animation that was made by Sam Jones in 2017, which sort of demonstrates um, what the model is doing really well. So you can see the kind of unstructured mesh with the bathymetry and this was using forcing from the, the West Commons one model. So with the slightly uh, less extensive domain, but um, essentially within that domain, similar to, 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 to what um, the structure of uh, West Commons two. Um, okay, so I'll first present the, the Loch Linny uh, model domain. So this is what we class as a kind of more traditional um, environment for agriculture and there's uh, as it's sort of shown in the earlier slide, there's a lot of that culture development uh, along, along the, the, the west and the east coastline um, of Loch Lenning. Um, so this is, this is nested within West Coms. Uh, it's got around 20,000 uh, nodes, uh, 30 vertical layers, so three times as many as West Coms. And the element, the horizontal resolution varies from around 800 meters sort of at the boundary um, to sort of 16 meters in, you know, in, in these, uh, the, with the high resolution sort of specifically um, concentrated around the Corrin Narrows uh, with the aim of kind of resolving the, um, you know, the, 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 the fresh water and jet dynamics around the Corrin Narrows and, and, and uh, you know, how, you know, how that's going to influence the, the, um, the simulation over the rest of the domain. So the, the key kind of agriculture relevant physics that we wanted to resolve in this model was the uh, the Loch Linny ball. So these are kind of successive pulses of fresh water that are released from the Corrin Narrows on, on sort of tidal cycles. Um, and these kind of freshwater dynamics uh, are kind of, so, so the question is why, why is understanding the ball dynamics important for agriculture? And that, you know, the, the freshwater dynamics will be important for, um, for, for local dispersion 
uh, you know, influencing fish behavior and, and the sea life distribution, as kind of is, is shown in this, in this nice illustration that was made by Andy Dale at SAMS. Um, so this is an animation of a short simulation using the high resolution uh, Loch Linley domain. So you can see these kind of freshwater pulses that come out uh, from the coral narrows and sort of travel, travel down the lock. So this is, uh, the, it's the dynamics of this that we're interested in. And uh, this is a sort of Hovmuller plot just from the Western coastline. Now I apologize now that I've plotted the, um, the color schemes inverted between the animation and the plot. So sorry for that, but, but you can see that you know, with the time series, these pulses of fresh water that are coming down the lock where you have a very thick sort of fresh water pulse that then thins through the tidal cycle. So um, this is some data from 2009 uh, from a, a, a ADCP deployment down near Lokakori. So this is sort of 18 kilometers downstream of Coron Narrows, so quite a long distance down uh, the western shoreline. But you can still see in the data this um, these bore structures that come through on, on sort of tidal cycles with uh, this, this uh, downlock, sort of negative downlock flow in the surface layers uh, corresponding to a kind of thick uh, sort of cold layer of water that then thins through the tidal cycle. Um, and just this was a sh uh, initial short test simulation that kind of showed uh, a more central location, but, but mimic this, this sort of structure quite nicely that we get these kind of downlock pulses of sort of thick, um, cold and fresh water coming through, um, which then sort of thin through the tidal cycle. So, it, um, Looking so so here I'm kind of looking at the surface divergence um, of, of the flow to try and get a bit more understanding of the board dynamics, and in this animation we kind of see we see a nice sort of positive divergence, um, which is kind of usually seen as as upwelling. Uh, yeah, positive divergence of the flow th sort of thinning or upwelling, um, which this this jet to the west of the narrows, which propagates down the lock um, and well down the west of the lock. And Loch lock, lock Lily is uh, it's a dynamically wide lock, so uh, the flows are influenced by Coriolis. So uh, we kind of see the flows, the downlock flows being pinned to the western coastline, which is what we're kind of seeing here. Um, so I'll just play that again. But it, the interpretation of this kind of western jet is, um, in this case, is that we've got this, you know, this freshwater layer that's being pulsed out of the coral narrows where it's being restricted. And as it's propagating down lock, it's able to kind of spread out and thin. Um, so sort of positive divergence is also kind of uh, associated with thinning. So we've got this thinning freshwater layer. Um, and then uh, this is kind of contrasted with this um, negative divergence, which negative divergence is sort of associated with convergence or, or downwelling east of the narrows. Um, and I've not sort of got to the point of really interpreting this yet, but you know, it could be, I guess, an interaction with this kind of west uh, spreading spreading jet um but yeah so on the left view i've got a time series from the central um sort of the central channel um shown as a sort of little cross in the animation where you can see these on almost on a tidal cycle these kind of pulses of upwelling and downwelling or, or you know positive and negative divergence and then below is showing the kind of intensity of of, of the divergence um so just for, for those who are kind of unfamiliar with um, sort of principal component or uh, empirical orthogonal function analysis, um, I've kind of, uh, I'm using this analysis on some data in the next few slides, so I'm just going to give a quick, uh, quick primer. Um, so for, first of all, EOF and PCA analysis are kind of, they're essentially the same, same methods, but are called different things by different disciplines. So generally EOF analysis is is what it's called when it's applied to a sort of morphological data sets. And EOF analysis attempts to find uh, sort of a relatively small number of independent variables, um, which are also known as sort of predictors or factors, which can pay, uh, convey as much of the original information as possible without redundancy. So it's quite often used in uh, dimensionality reduction in sort of very large uh, multi-dimensional data sets. Um, but it's also used to um, explore the structure of variability within the data set in an objective way um, or you know and, and to to extract the kind of leading modes of variability in a data set which is what i'll be using it for um, 
so yeah so sorry so then um in EOF uses uh, a set of orthogonal functions to represent a time series. So in this case, we've shown Z, um, or you know, it can be a spatial time series as I'll, I'll show you later, um, where EOF, the, sorry, the EOFs are, are sort of a spatial pattern um, of the major factors that account for the temporal variability in the time series. And PC here is, is the principal component which tells you uh, how the amplitude of each EOF varies in time. So this is quite easy to visualize in 2D, as, as you see here on the right, where PC1 is kind of your maximum, you know, your axis of maximum variability, and then your PC two, principal component two is then the, the, the next next axis. This gets sort of hard to visualize in, in obviously in, in higher dimensions. But I'll be applying this sort of analysis to, to two different types of data sets. So one is kind of uh, time slices, so spatial maps of uh, sea surface salinity, uh, surface currents and surface divergence, um, uh, which is you know, time slices of surface properties. And then the second way, which is kind of, I guess, more typical for, for PC analysis, uh, I'll be applying it to uh, lots of time series where each time series is at a different depth level. Um, and then, so yeah, so then what you end up getting out of something like this is your principal component time series. Um, indicating the time variability of each EOF uh, amplitude, the EOF, which gives the spatial pattern of each mode of variability, uh, and then your, your eigenvalue, which essentially gives you um, what percentage of the variability uh, is being explained by that, that mode. Um, so here I've applied the, this EOF analysis to, to the, the sea surface um, divergence. And what, what you kind of see on the left is, is EOF1. So this is the leading mode of variability in the surface divergence. And um, below that is then the principal component. So then the, the, the time amplitude of this, this EOF. And you can see it, you know, it, it follows these kind of, um, these jets that we see that are pulsed from the coron narrows and the principal component is, is a very typical kind of, uh, you know, following to the tidal cycle, which I'd, I'd you know, expect with pretty much all surface properties really for that the dominant mode of variability is going to be the, you know, this, this ebbing bore that's dominating uh, the flow. Um, what gets more interesting then is, is if you start going to the, the kind of lesser um, modes of variability. So at this point, I'm showing EUF3, so the, the third largest mode of variability. And you can see the, the principal component structure is very different. It, it's, you know, it's not varying with the tidal flow anymore. And Looking at the spatial pattern, you kind of see that it's really uh, dominated by variability along the coastlines, and this is quite interesting because it's um, you know this especially the the time series of the principal component uh, correlates with the the wind forcing in this case. And if I run a simulation not including uh, meteorological forcing, I get a very different spatial structure in in the US, and I don't see this kind of coastal upwelling and downwelling from the divergence. So this kind of already shows that you know at a certain level of model complexity, you're getting emergent you know emergent modes of variability that that you don't have in the lesser complex uh, case. Um, and then again, so so now um, again looking at com comparing the 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 third the EUF three the the third leading mode of variability on the left now I've got uh, the Westcom's model. So this is for the same period. Um, but for Westcoms and on the right, our kind of high resolution lock living model. And you can see that the spatial structure in the US is, is very different. And the, 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 the time series pattern um, is also different. And, and this is quite, this is also quite nice. It shows that as you go to this kind of lower vertical and spatial resolution, you're now picking up less of the, the, the lower modes of variability. So this is kind of one of the um, hypotheses that we're coming out with is for this is that it's as you go to higher complexity models, it's those lower modes of variability that you're, you're able to resolve. Um, and yeah, and this, this is kind of shown in the next few slides, that actually the leading modes of variability are picked up pretty well from the lower resolution models, but it's these kind of lower modes that, that are relevant or, or you know, could well be relevant for aquaculture, especially when you're looking at the freshwater and you know, the dynamics in the surface layer. Um, and that's where the kind of model complexity comes in. So this is now looking at the, the second method of applying the, the these kind of UF or PC analysis, where I'm applying it to um, each depth time series along each depth level. 
So on the left here is Westcoms, where I'm looking, I've manipulated the site, the UF weighting to give myself a, a depth, um, a weighting of each mode of variability across depth. So in blue, you can see the EUF1 is the leading mode of variability. You can see this is dominated by variability in the, in the surface, which is again what we'd expect from this surface bore that's released from the coral narrows and you know travels down the, the lock on the surface layer, which, which spreads out and thins. So that's dominating the, the variability in the simulation. Um, uh, I'll just say that it's, you know, this is again that lock of Cori. So this is shown in the map on the right corresponding to where we, we had the ADCP data. But what's also interesting with this is the um, the UF loading goes opposite sign at depth. So this kind of suggests that, you know, if you've got freshening in the surface layer, you're then having a corresponding but weaker, you know, uh, increase in salinity in the depth in the deep layers, which is kind of is something I need to go back to the models and kind of try and um, work out if this is the, you know, this is the case and, and how that's happening, but it could be a kind of quantum, quantum um, compensating sort of marine flow at depth that's that's increasing salinity. Um, yeah, so again, you've got the first first two modes um, of variability. Um, and then, so now on the, on the right, I've, I've done the same analysis for the high resolution lock linear model. Um, so this is for, yeah, again, again, for the salinity time series at each depth level. Uh, and you can see that the, the leading mode of variability, so in, in a UF analysis, the, the sign of the weighting doesn't actually matter. So sorry, so as we go down, looking at these figures, if, if the sign split, that doesn't matter. It's the structure that we're kind of interested in. So again, the, the leading mode of variability is very similar to the low resolution model, um, but we do start to get um, some, some divergence in, in the upper layers and kind of lower modes of variability, which is similar to what we were saying. Um, saying earlier that the kind of higher resolution models are kind of capturing the lower modes uh, better. Um, yeah, so then we can also correlate. So EUF3 in this case, sort of this mode two variability, it, it correlates with the meteorological forcing. So then you can pull out this, this mode and, 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 and say that that's kind of de being determined by, by the meteorology in, in this case. So, this gets a little bit different when we look at velo uh, velocity. So that was looking at time series of salinity across depth. And now we're, we're looking at um, velocity. And you can see there's, um, there's a lot more variability in the lower modes. Um, so we've still got this dominant, you know, EF1, this dominant mode of variability, which looks similar to this case for salinity. Um, however, the, the, the pattern of the, the lower modes of variability is much larger. Um, and there's, there's actually more, more difference now, especially in the kind of top, top you know, 15, 20 meters or so. So, um, so again, we can kind of split our, our, our EOS into the different modes of variability. Um, and in this case, so our meteorology, meteorology which co uh, correlates with the UF3, this is specifically the northward, northward wind, which kind of makes sense because of the orientation of, of Loch Linney that you might have. Um, if, if I'd rotated the, the wind components to a kind of uplock and crosslock, um, you know, I, I would assume that you get, a, you know, one of them in particular would be driving the variability in, in this kind of, in, in this mode of variability. So, um, so yeah, so what, um, I'm not sure you can see that. Um, so yeah, so as I say, the difference uh, in the top 15 meters here is associated with you know, we're, we've got better vertical resolution and, and because of this, we're kind of better resolving the, the, the bore in, in, in the top, in the top sort of 15, 15, 20 meters. So comparing the kind of different modes of variability with the ADCP data. So these aren't, these are different time periods. So the model simulation on the right is from a period in July, 2021. Uh, and on the left, we've got the Locker Cori ADCP data from September. Uh, late September 2009, but actually, you know, we get quite. Um, I was quite impressed with the how well the spatial patterns of the UF, um, the depth structure in the UF matches here. So um, we're kind of saying that the, the model is doing quite a good job um, of resolving each of these modes of variability compared to the data. Um, yeah. So then, on to our kind of. Um, you know, we, we call this, you know, our more exposed site. So this is 
located on the open shelf. Uh, it's on the northeast coast of Rum, so it's still sheltered from your prevailing wind conditions. But um, you know, obviously, you're still very exposed to, to anything from the, the northwest round, um, and it's very you know very different situation to the constrained sea lock. So in this case, um, we've we've sort of built a, a, a level of nesting. So with each level of nesting, we've increased the resolution. So, so in the, the in Westcoms two, uh, it resolves the the site of interest where where our high, you know our, our our fish farm is. Um, it resolves it with horizontal resolutions of around thousand meters. Our first level of nesting, which is in panel B, resolves the region um, with around two hundred meter resolution. Um, then the next level of nesting up to thirty meters, and then finally we go to a, you know around five meter resolution um, in the farm site. In, in our highest highest level of, um, of nesting, uh, and then we've also tested. So we've run these with thirty uh, vertical layers, but we've also tested some model runs with sixty vertical layers. So this is you know six times what Westcoms is, uh, and a re really really high high vertical as well as as well as horizontal resolution. Um, so you know again we we um, we went out to 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 run this time and, and did some. Um, collected some ADCP data, um, so we've got some mooring data to compared to the models, and that's shown here in the top panel. Um, so, just a quick, you know, a, a zoom in on this, you can see there's quite a lot of depth structure in in, in this. It's, it's very different to the lock mini data, but you can kind of see, um, you know, the evidence of internal waves. So on, on the left, where we've got our, um, our so sorry, on on the right is our eastward current velocities. Um, there's not much because of how close it is to the coast. It's it, it, eastward current velocities is the is the dominant flow um, direction, uh, and then on the right is the vertical current velocities. So so in the in the vertical current velocities, you can kind of see the evidence of internal waves um, influencing the site. Um, and then in our middle panel, we've got our kind of our first level of nesting, which is still a lower resolution model, uh, resolving the site um, to around 200 meter resolution, and we can see the the flow in this simulation is still very barotropic, so it's very uniform with depth, not much depth structure. Um, it looks quite different to the ACP data. Um, and then below that, a kind of uh, we've done a similar snapshot with the uh, with the high resolution model, um, and now you can kind of see there's a much more structure in in the depth profiles, both in the eastward and the vertical current velocities, as well as some evidence of you know internal waves. So this is kind of you know, something I need to do now is, is, is try and pick out how we're how well we're, we're resolving these kind of um, internal sort of baroclinic modes in, in, in the vertical velocity. Um, so this is an animation of the sort of three levels of nesting. So the, the low resolution run model is on the left. Uh, we've got kind of medium resolution model in the middle and then a high resolution on the right. Um, and you can kind of see on, on the left, this low resolution model that, you know, the, the, it's sea surface temperature and then, sorry, and then the current uh, vectors are kind of on in, in, in arrows. And you can see the tide sort of just ebbing backwards and forwards. Whereas in the high resolution model, there's a lot more structure, uh, spatially in what the currents are doing, how they're interacting with the coastline. Um, and this will obviously, you know, influence the dispersion of, 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 of things in the water column. And one example of this is, is kind of shown here. So this is the um, some time slices from the high resolution run model. Uh, some, so we're showing sea surface temperature and then the current vectors are, are also plotted on. But we've kind of got this, um, this, this current separation from, from a headline, headland here um, in run. So what we see in the simulation is this kind of on tidal cycle, we, we have this, this coastal current and this kind of coastal sep uh, current separation that occurs um, you know, close to the farm sites. This is something again which will influence the dispersion from from, from the site. Um, and to, sorry, just to yeah. So then, looking at trying to explain the dynamics of what's going on here, because I've not been able to pick out this coastal current in the UFs at, at the moment. So that's the thing I'm I'm still doing. But this is looking at the uh, again the surface divergence. Um, Along that northeast from coastline, and I've kind of I've regretted this at quite low resolution, so it's not very clear. But you can kind of see these bands of uh, positive and negative divergence, or you know, uh, inter interpreted as kind of upwelling and downwelling bands that kind of um, flow along the coastline and especially kind of originate from 
from this headland slight to the west. So you've got this point that sticks out. So as the flow is sort of going, going past this, and again, a, a time series of, of divergence at, at this, this site that's shown shows a very clear kind of, um, you know, pattern of, 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 of uh, positive negative divergence over the site. So this is this is quite you know this is interesting and something I need to kind of dig into because it will you know the, the, the surface divergence again will have is definitely an, an agricultural relevant um, dynamic. So going again to the now doing the UF analysis on the time series of um, of current velocities at each depth. Um, when we compare the high resolution and the low resolution models, we're, we're sort of seeing quite a lot of difference when we look at the RUM site, um, more difference I'd say than when we look at the Lotlini site. Um, so even in the, uh, the leading mode of variability, we've kind of got, we, we have different inflection points at depth. So, um, you know, there is different depth structure to, 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 to this mode of variability. And in the deep, there's a sort of, you know, there's this very different pattern to the leading mode of variability when we look at, um, when, we, when we're looking at the, the, the uh, especially at depth. Um, and you can see the, the increase in vertical resolution is having quite a big difference on how we're resolving these kind of vertical modes of variability. Um, and this kind of mode one, uh, EUF2, which correlates strongly with the water depth, you can see its depth and maximum is much higher in the water column uh, for the high resolution model than, than what we see in the, in the lower resolution model. Um, yeah, and, and again, it's kind of the meteorology. So we've got this, this EUF4, um, which has got a high, high mode variability, which correlates strongly with the, with the eastward wind. So in this case, obviously, because the position of RUM, there's this kind of low correlation with, with northward wind speeds, but we have quite a strong correlation with the eastward wind, which, because of its orientation, could also set up uh, you know, a coastal upwelling um, or, or downwelling, um, depending on its direction. Um, so then, so now on the on the left, I'm showing the, the ADCP data from the. This is now the same period, time period as is the high resolution models um, as it covers, and you know generally again the, the high resolution model here is doing, you know, quite a surprisingly good job um, compared to the data. So it's resolving sort of each of the modes of variability you know really well and that's, and better than the kind of lower resolution model, uh, including the depths of uh, you know where the maximum. Um, in the weighting of each each mode of variability is, is being is, is placed. Um, so yeah, the, the depth structure and the magnitude of, of each mode of variability is being represented quite you know well in, in, in the high resolution model here. So just to kind of to, to come to, to to finish off now really is the next step is really to couple the physics to, to the biology. So no, you know it, it's we, we say the you know about we've sort of been talking about these. Uh, agricultural relevant physics but the real test now is to couple biophysical models and see how if we're increasing the model complexity and we've got these new emergent physics coming out in our models how does that influence the the distribution of sea lice um, particularly um, so that's a lot what um, uh, Tom Adams was doing um, when he was at SAMS he's now um, at Scottish Sea Farms but this is um, some of the some of the um, analysis he did uh, where he was Looking at the, the the distribution of sea lice based on on particles released from particular farm sites shown on the left, and then the two panels on the right show the connectivity between farms. So, um, in the middle is showing uh, if there's sea lice being sourced from the run farm site, where these sea lice go, uh, and you know what farm sites receive lice from run, and on the right is um, what. Uh, what farms um, rum receives receives lice from? So this is you know this is quite nice and interesting. And for for the rum case, it kind of really reflects the the regional oceanography. So you know the the the, the, the sort of west coastal current that we that we get here is generally flowing um, from the southeast to, to the northwest. So that's what's kind of reflected in, in these kind of uh, plots of connectivity. Um, and then. Yeah, so then um, some more work that's, uh, so this work has been taken over uh, recently by Tim, um, who has added uh, 3D dynamics to, to, the, to the sea lice modeling. Uh, and what's been really interesting is, is, is here he's plotting up the, the, the difference in sea lice density between the 2D and the 3D simulations. 
and you can see there's quite a big difference in, in sea lice density. Um, but that, that difference in density is, is really um, constrained to, to the more traditional environment. So, so the sea locks, um, you know, you can see here Loch Linney in, in particular, um, show, shows quite, a, you know, quite an increase in, quite a difference in, in the density of sea lice. So this is quite interesting. Um, and then what he's done, which has been really you know, even better, is he's then been able to partition this into behavior. So he's been able to show where within Loch Linney, um, oh, sorry, where within the domain, these differences, are they coming from sea lice um, you know, swimming, floating or sinking? You know, what, what, how does the 3D behavior, what, what, you know, what, where, why is that causing the differences in, in density? Um, so yeah, so, so what he's finding, if, if you include these 3D dynamics, you're, you're getting greater connectivity, higher density near the shore. Um, and in, what's quite important for Loch Linney and, and these sort of sea lock sites is you get um, higher density further up, um, further up the lock. So, um, you know, they're, 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 they're sinking at low salinity, which means they're able to, to stay up um, higher up in, in the lock, which, you know, previous simulations just using 2D dynamics um, predicted quite low, low uh, sea lice concentrations up in, in the locks. Um, so yeah, so just in, in summary, um, you know, what, what we found so far is that the higher resolution, more complex models uh, better resolve the lower order, uh, low, lower order modes of variability. Um, so you know, now what we need to do is by coupling to the biophysical, we need to work out if these lower modes are, are still important to, to aquaculture. Um, what we find is, you know, our traditional sea lock environment, uh, Loch Linney, is, 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 is really complicated, e even though these are kind of the more traditional um, sites used for aquaculture. You know, in this case, we're complicated by tidal narrows, freshwater dynamics, uh, surface intensified flows. And our more kind of exposed um, open shelf region uh, on RUM is still complicated, but, but in, in different ways. So you know, we've got internal waves, barotonic dynamics. Um, we're finding sort of emergent physics uh, as we increase the complexity or the resolution of the models. And then by adding biology, we're, we're kind of seeing the, the importance of 3D dynamics. So that's a clear indication that in terms of complexity, that the 3D behavior is, is making quite a big difference in, in terms of sea life distributions. And, and this difference is even more, you know, is, is enhanced in the more traditional inshore settings. Um, showing sort of higher connectivity and more uplock dispersal. So again, sort of, you know, as I'll, I'll echo that, you know, it's not, as, these are only two sites and it's not as easy as one site's exposed and one site is, is sheltered. There's, you know, there's this continuum. And, um, you know, when I add the, 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 this third BDNC site to the analysis, this is a tra transitional site and I'm sure we'll see, um, you know, different controls and, and different things that are important, but, but for this, that as you, know, as, as you might find it at lots of different sites, so so it kind of emphasises the you know the need for um, you know picking the right complexity um, of mod modelling. You know, all, all the sites needs um, you might find as you increase uh, model complexity, you are seeing um, yeah more more dynamics that that will be relevant to aquaculture. Um, and, and then finally, what. The, yeah, the last thing is to kind of we still need to improve our understanding of the traditional inshore sites. So it's not just a point of, you know, we, all right, we understand the inshore traditional sites that we do aquaculture in. Now we can we, we can move to off, you know, we need to understand offshore so we can move off there. Actually, there's there's just as much understanding to be gained from, from both our inshore traditional sites and our kind of yeah, um, the new more exposed offshore sites. Um, okay, that's all for me. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Max. That was really interesting. Um, it was really fab to hear about it. If anyone has any questions, um, it would be great if you could pop them in the Q&A section and uh, I will uh, ask Max. But I think I'll kick off with, with a question while they drop in. Um, I don't know if this is, uh, this is something you can answer, but uh, is, there, is there a way um, that you could say, you know, is more exposed sites better for aquaculture or the more sheltered ones? Is, is it leaning one way or the other yet um, from what you've uh, researched? Um, yeah, I, I definitely don't think we're sort of there to answering it yet. Um, as I say, there, there's this, you know, what we, we're just finding there's this big spectrum of, of 
you know, of, of foreseen mechanisms for different sites that as you go say more sure you're just getting a, a different kind of percentage of, of, of what forcing mechanisms uh, controlling the dy dynamics of that site um, I think a lot of obviously space I think is probably the leading benefit to going offshore I think you know both in terms of the the, the sector's kind of ambitions you know that the, the agriculture sector in Scotland wants to expand hugely so they're going to need more space to do that and you know offshore presents the ability to expand and build bigger farms spread over a bigger area so you have less you know theoretically you have less environmental footprint um or less environmental impact um you know per i guess per fish or per biomass um but then what we're so another element of the project led by exeter is looking at sort of wave modeling and, and i think you you know you get to a point where it is as much an, an engineering problem as it is a kind of you know, a, a, a physics, well, you know, a oceanography problem. So there's definitely kind of steps to be made to, uh, as I said at the start, you know, the operation costs in more offshore environments is much higher. So it kind of it is a trade a trade off between the benefits and and that. So yeah, at some point it becomes more of an engineering problem to 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 make these uh, operations that um, that are going to stand up to to the beating they're going to get in in these more exposed environments. Great. Thanks for that. Does anyone uh, have any questions that they want to, to drop in the, the chat from us? I'm just going to speak. I'm having difficulty putting something into the QA. and I don't know why. Maybe my technical systems are failing. Max, you foresee a change in species. Um, is it going to be a different kind of distribution of aquaculture as the conditions within the cages change? Um, that's a really good question. I don't, I don't feel that's one I'm qualified to as a... I mean, yeah, as a physicist, I must admit, I'm not, um, I, I don't understand the, the, the sort of the differences between species that we, we very much focused on, you know, on salmon um, farming. So, yeah, I don't feel I'm, I'm qualified to. So my second question is going to worry you as well then, which is, mm -hmm. I was wondering in more dynamic conditions, you would change the quality of the flesh. I know that they've done some work here you know, looking at swimming and how that improves flesh quality, et cetera. And I guess if you go offshore, um, you might have more directional current. So you might actually select sites that have a particular level of hydrodynamics that particularly enhance the product. Yeah, yeah there's, uh, there's definitely um, definitely something you could try and optimise. I think we, we had a, a review paper out, I think, last year, um, led by Bernat, uh, in that morrow, uh, who was um, which, which kind of talked about all the kind of different, as you say, benefits or from particular fin fish in moving to offshore regions. And, and as you say, there's this kind of you'd expect to be moving into regions that have higher current velocities and or, or different current velocities. So therefore, the species and, and what they each species has an optimum range of current velocities to keep them healthy. But then, obviously, if you exceed this, then the energy expenditure of trying to swim against this current is is, is going to be detrimental to to the quality of the fish um, but then it's not always that's quite that simple so you know in some of the regions when we're modeling you know if you're close to a tidal narrows in an inshore you know, a hypothetically sheltered region you might get much higher current velocities than you would at say at, at this rum um, you know a site on the open shelf you might have very high current velocities during your one-off storms which aren't very frequent but you might have an inshore region near a tidal narrows which every tidal cycle is experiencing very high tidal velocity so it's yeah it's i think not... if, you, if you stick a salmon cage in the falls of water you might get some uh, uh, opposition to that but thank you max <laughs> yeah. thanks david awesome we've got another couple of questions drop in one from ibrahim does your work cover the therapeutic effect of aquaculture on fisheries resources any recommendations on this when this will be solved um yeah again uh, as a I've, I've sort of stayed away from the biology as, as much as i can it gets far too complicated so i, I don't know much about the kind of of, of, of of that side of things um uh i mean there's as I said at the start, one of the hypotheses is if you move to these offshore environments, then you you, you could have healthier fish. So you, you could potentially say, I think some of the data we looked at was suggesting that more offshore exposed regions had less medicine treatments, I think. 
um, but I'd need to go back and check that. Cool, great. Um, another question from uh, Emma. Is there a way to define a level of model complexity that is good enough, i.e. resolves the relevant physical and biology, but it's quick and easy to run mm. enough for impact assessment purposes? That, yeah, that, that's a really good question. Um, and it's you know, really hard to know a, a priori because, as I say, the, the, the CEPA regulation that's case by case, that, you know, that might be... Um, you know, at what point that is decided, what level of model complexity is needed for a particular site um, is probably quite early in the process. And before you may, you know, if, for example, that, you know, the RUM site on, on paper, you know, might look quite simple. Um, you know, so some of these sites that we see in Loch Linney on, on paper might, you know, in, until you kind of really get down. And I, I guess, you know, it's going to be informed by it, once you put in moorings and got some ADCP data and things like that, you can start to disentangle. Um, she can do a lot, obviously this analysis you can do on, um, on the data as well as the modeling. So you can kind of pick out the modes of variability and give an idea of what sort of level of complexity is needed. Um, but you're right, it's a big um, trade-off, especially in, in, in terms of getting the right sort of resolutions. And you know, if the, the model I use with, with Epicom and a lot of the unstructured grids are really good for this because you, you do have that flexibility of, of again, the trade-offs more the, the domain size relative to, to where you're where you're focusing your your resolution. But, but yeah, that's a, it's a you know, really hard question. Great. Um, there's another question from Alexander. Lice can accumulate in downwellings or into positive phototaxis. So, does the high-resolution model identify areas that this will occur that would not be identified in low-resolution models? Um, it's not something I've looked at, but hypothetically, yes, uh, you, you, you know, as, as I've shown with the surface divergence, and you can, you could quite easily extend that to, to, um, you know, to analyze certain uh, depth levels, uh, sort of blocks through the water column. So you could quite easily, you could identify where, at least where the convergence is going to be. And as you say, if you're, you know, the convergence uh, indicates downwelling. So, um, and I guess you'd have you know, certain velocity speeds that that maybe the, the sea life would, would not be able to to to, to you know overcome it with their swimming speeds would, would be quite interesting. So um, and and yeah, so then what we've what it looks like is is although um, the leading modes of variability would probably be quite similar to an extent when you go to a lower resolution model, um, you know, they're, 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 there's lower modes of variability which would be picked out by the higher resolutions that that could be important. Awesome. And we've got another question drop in from Crawford. Um, the theoretical results of moving from 2D to 3D were really interesting. How might this aspect of the biophysical modeling be validated empirically? Um, yes, good question. I, I mean, um, with a lot of good partnership with this, this, you know, some of the, this, the, the fish farming companies, you, I guess you could use you could probably back some of it out from the sea lice counts that they do on the fish farms, um, especially in terms of stuff going, the, the, the quantities of sea lice going up and down a lot. Um, but yeah, I agree that this, this sort of, um, you know, it needs to be validated just to show that it's, um, you know, a, a real feature. But yeah, no, not, not any other ideas at, at present. I'll have to go away and think about that and speak to Tim as well. He's, he's, He's more of the expert on the sea life and biophysical modeling than I am. Well, that was fab. I've just given another quick, you know, if anyone has any last minute questions, please tuck them in now. Um, just give that a, a few seconds. As I say, thank you to Max for, uh, for taking time to do this and delivering this talk. It was really, really fascinating to hear um, more about the, the physical uh, uh, oceanography side um, of the aquaculture work going on which is which is really fantastic and just to say that our next webinar is on the 25th of May with David Bailey from University of Glasgow um, so hopefully we will see you all um, on the last Wednesday of next month again on the 25th of May um, and with that I reckon uh, if there's no more questions then uh, we'll say thank you to Max again and end the webinar I hope everyone has a fantastic day and we'll see you next month Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Mike. It's very entertaining.